All right, Rob, get us started. Sorry to make you wait there. Uh, what's your vibe on this Vibe Check Tuesday? Okay, so I'm feeling pretty good, Craig. I, I think, you know, everybody's upset. We all want to be uh, negative about this, that, the third. I'm feeling pretty good. When's the last time we had two games without a turnover? You know, the kicker is new, but when's the last time we kicked a bunch of field goals in a game and actually made them? You know, whatever. So we lost the Giants game, quote unquote, by their Graham Gano going out. It doesn't really matter. Um, I think that the moves that they've made have been pretty decent. Noah Brown, you know, uh, I, I do believe he's playing better than Jahan would have. But a big question that I actually, I, I said this to Anthony, but I want to ask your opinion on this. Sure. Should we have moved one of those middle guys during the trade deadline as opposed to someone like Sweat? Um, um, it, yeah, that's a good and somewhat complicated question. Um, the, the simple answer is probably not. And the reason is not because you're not a better football team today with Montez Sweat playing the way he is versus John Allen and Deron Payne playing the way they are. Just very simply, the contract situation is more complicated. Than, and, and I think in the end of the day, like one, Sweat was coming up on the end of his rookie deal. He was due a bunch of money. Paying him that at this stage of the rebuild limits you in other places. I think they're better off not having paid that money where John and Duran had already been paid. And thus, if you trade them last year, there's dead cap money that you have to take on, which I know is incredibly unsexy, like super businessy answer, yeah. but it's a huge factor in it. The thing is, though, and I hate to say this because like John Allen's given a lot to this city. He's from here, trading the hometown kid. Like it's complicated, but from a financial standpoint, you can trade him this this uh, trade deadline, and there's no financial ramifications. There's no more dead money. There's no prorated signing bonus. There's no future anything you have to worry about. If he doesn't fit anymore in your long term plans, you could flip him this time. Um, obviously they still have to go find an edge, but I do think that they like that will be that in corner seem to be shaping up through two weeks in a training camp. Their number one priority is going into the draft next year. Right. So I do have one more question for you. You know, how, how do you feel about the offense, not turning everything over or not turning the ball over yet? Great. I understand that you know, <laughs> we, yeah, Exactly. We're we're not doing the things that we did before, and it's like small steps as opposed to giant leaps, right? Yeah. And the more and more cohesive as we get, we'll be better. And not to take away from the last caller, but, you know, when's the last time we've seen something like this? When's the last time that we've actually had an opportunity <laughs> to be optimistic during every game? We're yeah. at least in it, I, you I, know, and I, I yeah. agree. Yeah, I think, Rob, I got to let you run because we got a couple more calls and we're running up against the clock. But, you know, I, I think the what you're feeling, Rob, is uh, is competence. What you're feeling is an organization that actually has professionals in place and knows what they're doing and is building things the right way. And that doesn't guarantee anything. Um, but doing it the other way guarantees nothing. And I, and I do think you have to. And this, this ultimately, like to go back to Gary's call, is my substantive disagreement with Gary is – He's like, I'm pessimistic this year. They're not very good. And I'm like, there was no planet that they could have been good this year. Not with the way the salary cap works, not with the way the draft works, not with the way the free agency works. There is no planet that they could be good this year. They are going to be better than last year. And that is like when he talks about, oh, these guys don't move the needle. They do. They only move it so far, but they're not going to be a four-win team this year. I would be stunned. Something terrible would have to happen for them to be a four-win team. They deserve to be a four-win team last year. That is moving the needle. And the, I do think this is also a team that showed growth from training camp to week one, showed growth from week one to week two, and I would expect, well, it's not going to be linear. By the time week nine rolls around, they're a hell of a lot better of a football team than they are right now because they're still learning each other. Uh, coaches uh, and players, co you know, coaches learning, learning their players, players learning their coaches, players learning each other. 301-230-0980. Let's go to Andre in Alexandria. Andre, what's your vibe on this Vibe Check Tuesday? Well, I feel good about the offense. They're not where I want them to be, but I like the direction they're going in to keep it short because, you know, you're short on time. And I'm getting pretty sick and tired of Payne and Allen making excuses every single year. They've been here for years. 
and every year they're not dominant. They let the offensive team or linemen on the other teams dominate what they do instead of they dominate what the offensive linemen do. They're being controlled regardless who the coach, who the owners are, and who players around them. They always get taken out the game. They don't enforce their will or their talent on the offensive line that they're going against. And I'm pretty done with their excuses. Trey, I will, if we could trade both of them, get rid of both of them. That's where I'm at. Uh, Andre, thanks for the call. Um, I Look, I get why Andre's frustrated. I get defensively why you're not psyched about what this team did over the weekend. I do think that is an overreaction. I do think that they are probably playing better than people realize because people think that they're like the worst two defensive tackles in the league right now. Um, and that's, that's definitely not true. Um, but they definitely need to also play better. Like, I do think that 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 is an important point. I don't I don't want it to come off as make whether it's making excuses, whether it is, um, you know, whatever other version of that you want to make it. Like I just, they got to be better. But I also understand some of the reasons why they're not better right now, and some of it is them not playing well, and like they need to execute on a higher level. Some of this is they are not fully being set up to be great in the way that, you know, maybe a 2022 version of them, 2021, when these guys had monster years, that they were kind of built and set up structurally to, to play better. Right now, unfortunately, the back-end coverage is so bad that they are being hung out to dry a little bit longer. They require more bodies and pass coverage. So some of the blitz schemes that they want to roll up that could result in some more pressures and some more sacks. Um, some of the the box counts that they want to run um, or they want to have in terms of bodies down by the line of scrimmage, like those aren't available because they need to have extra players back, aka two high safety looks instead of one. And what that means is, I know this is like super football nerdy and it's going to sound like excuses, but like this is the reality. Take Take it for what it is. If I'm a quarterback and I see a good look to run into and my double teams are set up perfectly because the other team is scared of you know my stud first-round pick receiver hitting a 70-yarder, I'm going to tap my helmet, check to the run, and we're going we're gonna to run into a great look. And that's what happened to them a lot last week is Daniel Jones looked up, saw, hey, we can double-team Allen, we can double-team Payne. Do those guys need to play better against double teams? Absa freaking lootly. Both things can be true at once, but man, that is a tough job. And so I, I have to that level some sympathy for those guys, but within that context, they need to play better. Okay, real quick, last but not least, uh, Tion's with us uh, to finish out Vibe Check Tuesday. Tion, I got like 30, 45 seconds for you. Sorry to keep it short, but uh, Tischler's coming up at five. Last word goes to you, though, my friend. Okay, man, no problem. Thank you for having me. Um, right now, m the vibe check for me is this is fantastic. I'm actually seeing the offense being built, a commander's offense being built from the ground up. First thing assessment is I know that Jane, Jane Daniels' uh, seal, uh, floor is he's going to be a good game manager. And we're seeing the offense grow around it. Now, what I want to see is if we start getting leads, are they going to release the defense and, and, and make them like the uh, old Indianapolis defense? Um, since we can't cover anybody, I think later on in the season, we're going to become a more blitz-heavy defense when we have a lead. And I think it's going to be um, all pertinent on our offense getting us the lead. And I want to see how that looks. Tion, I think that's a great point, too. I appreciate the call, and hopefully we can get you a little more space to, to chat in the future. Um, they have been in some bad time score situation deals. So do they have the opportunities – later in the season to play differently because this offense can get up. Obviously, if they just finish in the red zone, right? Like, if you want to be pessimistic, red zone, terrible. Uh, you know, defense gives up a little too much. They got lucky and no, no kicker for the Giants. If you want to be optimistic about the game on Sunday, it's also really easy. They could have easily won, like, 35-18, right? They could have just as easily scored a bunch of those in the red zone as opposed to kicking seven field goals. Even if they get half of those in in – uh, the end zone and on like half of those drives they were in third or fourth and one inside the 10 yard line could have had a fresh set of downs and they jumped off sides like not even hey it's third and one at the one and now you're you got six yards to score and one play to do it no 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 they were like third and one at the three and would have had four downs to score from the two and they couldn't stay on sides I'd have to think that gets better I'd have to think that that, that gets coached up 
And if it does, then what does the red zone offense look like? And also in training camp, there were some stretches where they were dominant in the red zone. So I, I think that there is the potential there, including, by the way, they just torched, I think it was Miami, in the joint practice. So it's not like they just did it to their own defense. So I, I think that's something to watch moving forward. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.